across the fence, we travel to the high country of Greensboro Bend to get up close and personal with one of the oldest cattle breeds in the world. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. Highland cattle have been roaming the remote mountaintops of Scotland since the 6th century. These hardy animals were a favorite of Queen Victoria. She decreed that Highlands would always have a home at the royal residence of Balmoral Castle. Here in Vermont, Highlands are also receiving the royal treatment. Four generations of the Shatney family have worked to preserve the breed in order to provide a living and to produce what some consider to be the best steak in the world. Across the fences, Keith Silva has our story. Highlands are thought to be one of the oldest cattle breeds in the world. Raised for centuries on the cold coasts and rugged highlands of Scotland, these animals are resilient and robust. Between their horns and distinctive long hair, nothing else looks like a highland because nothing else is a highland. I get along with animals probably better than I do people. And I guess if I can get along with these highland cattle, I guess that's enough. Nearly 50 years ago, Ray Shatney's father thought the pedigree, uniqueness, and vigor of Highlands would be a good fit for his family's Rocky Hill Farm in Greensboro Bend. My dad, back in the late uh, mid-60s, decided that he wanted something different besides just dairy cows, and he had a friend who had a Highland cow. He sort of inherited the Highland cow for $50, which was, I guess was more than what she was worth back then. But. He loved the Highlands and he built a Highland herd. This farm wouldn't be worth much for anything else. It's definitely not an area for dairy farming. These uh, hillside farms in Vermont don't do well in dairying and uh, it's great for the Highlands. It's wooded and there's a lot of stone here. So I think my dad purchased these places so we'd have something to do Sunday afternoon was picking stone. And we still haven't got them all picked. They keep, a new shipment comes in every year. Along with being hardy, Highlands are also gentle and known as easy keepers. To show how laid back his Highlands are, Shatney likes to hone his hairstyling techniques. And the cows like it too. As for those horns, well, Shatney makes sure to keep his distance when mom is around. The only time we have to worry that I worry about the horns and I have the same problem with an animal without horns. They're good mothers and they will protect a newborn calf. So we're real careful around the newborns. You'll see the calves out behind me here. Almost everyone has a tag in it. The uh, young ones that don't have a tag, mom said I couldn't give it a tag. Between this farm in Greensboro Bend and another in Plainfield, the entire herd numbers 170. About two-thirds are purebred Highlands, and the rest are Highland Crosses. For Shatney and his wife, Janet Stewart, it's the right size herd and the perfect fit for their family. One of the things we're trying to do is produce a model that other farmers and other people who want to farm can do. They are not a commercial breed. They are very slow growing. It is very hard to um, make them economically viable, which is why very few people raise them, and which is why most people who have Highland cattle stay with the breed five years. And so what we want to do is show people how you can be successful, because we want the Highland breed to continue. Because Highlands don't grow as fast as more commercial breeds, like Angus or Hereford, Shatney crossbreeds his Highlands with shorthorns. This keeps the farm financially viable, by being able to have more meat ready for market more often, while also maintaining the Highland genetics. The Highland cattle in Scotland would probably be just about extinct today if it wasn't for crossbreeding. So they discovered many years ago that the Highland cattle will not survive just uh, being Highland cattle. The Highland's history classifies them as a heritage breed. These breeds are popular with small-scale farmers who want to raise their own meat or develop a value-added product. Heritage is, is a lifestyle preservation. It's, it's Joe Emenheiser is University of Vermont Extension's livestock specialist. One of the most important or valuable tools in, 
in production agriculture and viability from an animal genetics or breeding standpoint is crossbreeding. And, and the power that, that's gained from crossing two breeds together um, is really huge. And, and the trick is that that crossbreeding requires that the breeds be preserved and be able to be put together. And getting crossbred calves that grow considerably more efficiently, uh, have higher meat yield and so on and so forth, but they're still doing everything that they want to preserve the highland breed and to enjoy them for the reasons that they have them. As majestic as these animals are, with their long hair and long horns, their place on this farm has one purpose. Shatney sends at least one animal a week off for processing. Because the highlands are pasture raised and slow to grow, their meat is tender with low levels of cholesterol and high in omega-3 fatty acids. Their hair acts as insulation, so highlands store fat in the meat, and fat is where the flavor is at. A lot of the key to our being able to um, get people familiar with the Highland beef is you get it in their mouth. And once it's in their mouth, that's what they want. Because um, as people tell us, they've never tasted anything like it. If you look, anything fresh is a dollar off per pound. I have one fresh... Stewart believes this one-on-one -on -one tasting is believing marketing approach gives their business a unique niche in the marketplace. I've been to a lot of conferences where people say, we've got to get into the Boston markets, okay, we've well, got to get into the New York markets. Okay. That's okay. not our goal. Take care. We want remember, to produce healthy food for Vermonters, and we want to produce it in a way that they can come see where their food is raised, that they can come be with the animals, they can understand that this is how cattle are supposed to be raised. And right now, I don't want to have a lot of new markets. So you might say to me, how come you're not doing much more at promoting your beef? I can't raise any more beef than we're selling. This farm and these animals have a strong pull on this family. Chatney's grandson, Philip, has started to help out. He's the next generation to develop a love for these animals and this lifestyle, something Ray understands well. What have I learned in 50 years dealing with Highlands? Probably learned some stuff about myself that they like being out here and I sort of like being out here too and no matter what else happens when I was working, uh, you could always come back to the farm and whether you just sat and watched them, they're awful good therapy. They feed you more ways than one. Highland cattle, good for the body, better for the soul. In the highlands of Greensboro Bend, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. Well, thanks, Keith. If you can't get to the farmer's market in Montpelier, you can visit Janet and Ray and the cows at greenfieldhighlandbeef.com. There you'll find a list of restaurants and retailers who sell products made from Greenfield Highland beef. Well, at least once or 10 times a day, dog owners wonder what their pet is thinking or saying. Well, a class at UVM is helping humans to think and speak like a dog. Rebecca Gollin has our story. Many college students will tell you that when learning a new language, it can be very helpful to practice with a native speaker. Hi. Oops. That's wow. your name, buddy. That's just what this class at UVM is doing. Except that in this classroom, the native speakers have four legs and are covered in fur. You can't just expect a dog to sit when you tell them to sit. It's like speaking in a foreign language. So the class is called Understanding and Speaking Dog. Students are learning how to communicate with dogs in order to train them. Most people have opinions, thoughts, philosophies about dog training, and what I teach is science. It's fun. Good girl. 
Um, so remember, don't say the word. Jamie Shaw is a longtime dog trainer and you adjunct word, instructor and in the Department of Animal Science. She's teaching her students how to teach a dog to, to sit. Right. It's not necessarily they understand the word, like sit means to actually sit down. It's it's that they understand that's what you want from that from that sound. So so it's kind of, it's more like they understand that you want that rather than oh that's what that means. What we cover in the course is. This, much of it is the exact same thing you would learn in a basic level psychology course. And it's about reinforcement and you know, literally how does training work? How can you work with the brain to accept and process information? What's Other the best way to do that? Which is not fun. So, Shaw says um, that the key to success ready? is to shape the dog's be behavior like in said, a like series of small steps with plenty of rewards along the way. She uh, so recommends coming up sit, with goals and developing a step-by-step -step step training plan. And the then, way that plan is implemented yeah, is called funny. operant conditioning. Well, operant conditioning is a process where you choose a behavior that you would like a subject to know. So it could be with your roommate that you want to teach your roommate to pick up her dirty laundry instead of leaving it all over the house. Or it could be you want to teach your dog to sit when you ask it to sit instead of having it jump on visitors when they come to the house. You can't just take a dog and put it in the position that you want it to be in. Like if you're teaching a sit, you can't just take it and physically put it into a sit and do that a bunch of times and expect it to learn it as well. So what shaping is, is successive approximation. You're taking little baby steps towards the behavior. So every time it like puts its butt down a little bit more, you reward that and you use luring. You have like a treat and you put it, kind of put it into the position that you want by making it want to be in that position with the treat in your hand. A double major in animal science and psychology, Katie Hayden is interested in dog training as a career. She's been practicing what she's learning at the local dog daycare where she works. One of the things that I really have loved in like the past six months or so that I've been like working with dogs professionally is I really love just seeing the improvement that they make and that is kind of what drives me on and so it's not so much, I mean it, it's a little surprising to see how much they can learn in such a short amount of time but it's really, that's what I love to see and that's what makes me love training dogs. What you need to do to get a dog that doesn't know how to sit or stand or whatever to do it. And Jamie especially it makes it look so easy. Her dogs are so well trained. So the, some of the ones that she brings in, no problem. We'll just sit on command. They'll just drop, lay down on the floor, and she makes it look so easy. And as we're learning tonight, it's a lot more difficult than it is. And it looks. Shaw brings dogs to class throughout the semester in order to demonstrate certain habits and techniques. Most of the canine guest lectures here this day are untrained rescue dogs from Random Rescue in Williamstown. At first, like I didn't realize how many steps you really have to do it if you want them to do like a harder step. You have to like break it up into really really small steps. Like if it's like a complicated trick, like how little how small the steps are in order to reach it and how like if you if they're not getting it you have to change the whole plan or if they are getting it you don't want to do too much. You might get excited that they're getting it and you want to keep going but you have to like stop and just let them take a break and pick it up again and just the repetition of it doing the same trick over and over and over again until they master it. Good boy. And I back up when I train this because it makes the dogs run a little bit faster to you, makes it more fun. Teaching dogs some new tricks and learning some themselves, these UBM students are on their way to being fluent in the language of dog. In Burlington, I'm Rebecca Gollin with Across the Fence. Thanks, Rebecca. That's our program for today. Thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.